Hi, and welcome to Cryptography. I'm your host, Brandon Starr. This is episode 214 of Cryptobiography, and it's part 9 of Snake Magic. We are back in the saddle after a couple weeks off. Uh, I was actually away uh, visiting relatives, and just, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be able to write. And so I did prepare those episodes ahead of time, and it worked out pretty well. Um, it turns out if you do it right, you can actually f make it so that the podcast will post ahead of time you sort of set the time for the actual posting and that becomes the episode and then all you have to do is or all i have to do is put a couple of social media uh, posts out about it and that worked pretty well um unfortunately they have this weird time zone thing so it was actually coming out like much later than I was expecting it to. So uh, I ended up sort of, essentially they went out on Mondays of each of the two last two weeks. But in any case, it worked. Uh, if you did, you know, in listen to Annie uh, or The Last Zombie Hunter, hope you enjoyed them. It is fun to kind of revisit these stories when I, uh, when I you know, put these uh, edited episodes together and sort of see like you know what I've been writing about and some of the changes that I've made you know to my writing and and different things that I've played around with and that sort of thing anyway I think it's time to get on with this so here we go with part nine uh since it's been a couple weeks uh, Nedra you know they're on the wagon train now there's been you know some ins instances of you know things uh, going odd some things attacking the the wagon train and so on um, and here we go. It was eleven days later, having traveled down out of the mountains, when they met some Nazrach. The, st the train stopped. Nadra from the last wagon had no idea what was happening. She waited and watched. She saw Eugene join Garrick, who climbed out of his carriage and mounted his horse, which had been led behind the carriage. Wilfred stayed at the back, and as Nadra looked at him, she noticed he seemed to be nervous, not at all pleased to be the only guard at the back of the train. Why should he be nervous, thought Nadra. What does he know? Eugene and Garrick disappeared somewhere at the front of the train. Obden, too, got off the cook wagon seat and went forward. Nadra looked around. The sun was high in the sky, yet it was still somewhat dim and gloomy here. There were trees all around, and thickly leaved and close set, and there was deep brush between them. The combination made the area gloomy, even with weather that should have been pleasant. After a while, Nader caught a bit of motion out of the corner of her eye. She looked around and saw that there was a Nazrach behind two trees not far from the road. Instinctively, she moved her head so that she would be looking at the Nazrach not straight on, but at an angle. This way, Wilfred, if he was looking at her, would not know the direction she was actually staring. She could tell that the Nazrak had positioned herself, it seemed to be female to her, in such a way that Nadra could see her, but Wilfred and anyone else from the train could not. She was dressed in a way she had never seen before. She didn't know how to describe it, but it was both rustic and beautiful. The Nazrak had short hair like hers. If it was really like hers, it was as long as it could be and similar in being both dark and straight. Her face was shadowed, but Nadra thought she might be beautiful, though she couldn't have, said, couldn't have said why. Where she was most unlike Nadra, however, was in her scales, which, unlike her brown and tan, were bold blue and green everywhere she could see them. Even in the shade of the trees, the color stood out. She was staring at Nadra in a way that she could only think of as inquiring, but what she was asking, Nader didn't know. The Nazrak kept looking at her for some time. Nader refused to look away. Some instinct within her said that she should stay strong. Why that should be, though, she didn't know. Unless it was belonging. Part of her hoped that this Nazrak could show her, would show her, how to belong. She had been the lone Nazrak, chattel to humans, all her life. She had always been the outsider. She had only a few who she even might call friends, and she had never really been close to anyone. 
The sudden ache that bloomed in her heart threatened to make her shake to the tip of her tail. There was some noise at the front of the wagon train. Nader only noticed in a vague way. She was too focused on the Nazrak, who continued to look at her. She could feel her heart beating hard and rapidly in her chest. Ogden reappeared at the front of the cook wagon, mounting over the seat and landing in front of Nadra, who had turned as soon as she felt his weight jar the wagon. She did not want anyone else knowing there was a Nazrak looking at her. "'You're coming with me,' he said, crooking, crooking a finger at her. His other hand was sh holding a short club. Not seeing any option, she followed him over the seat and to the ground. She looked around as she slithered after Ogden, but saw no more Nazrak in the trees. As she approached the foremost wagons, she saw that most of the guards, and really most of the people of the wagon train, were all standing side by side. They were facing a similarly sized group of Nazrak. Nadra looked at them all one by one. They were all dressed in a similar manner to the Nazrak she'd seen in the trees. Most were like her in shape, though some seemed a little more snake-like, especially what she assumed were the males, as they did not have hair, and the scaly portions of their skin went up higher on their torsos. On one male, who was naked to the waist, his scales actually went up to his shoulders, leaving only his head, neck, and arms with human-like skin. In coloration, they were not much like her. They did have similarly black hair, but the snake parts were very different. There are some that had brown scales over part of their tails, but most of them were of bright colors, some blue and green, others red and yellow. There were three in the middle, a female in the very center, flanked by one male and one female, who seemed to her to be the leaders. This was mostly because they were a bare half-step ahead of their brethren at their sides. The middle leader had bright blue scales all down her tail. They had weapons, all of them, mostly spears and bows and arrows. Nadra had overheard enough conversations between the humans to know that they would think of any group that did not use swords and at least some metal armor to be completely lacking in civilization. At least for now, none of the humans were armored, either. She had seen them put some armor on, making sure it fit right and was in good shape, but that was usually for a short time in the evenings. Sometimes they also wore it when the wagon train had stopped for the night, particularly when danger seemed to be about, but not when on the road. None of them were prepared to travel while wearing their armor. And even when wearing it, it was simple, not really protecting everything. It was mostly to protect their torsos and heads. When she got up behind Garrick and the others, she saw the, the two sides were in a sort of stalemate. They were looking at each other, saying nothing. Garrick had taken up the center position on the human line. When he heard her slither up behind him, he looked behind him, doing so slowly and without showing fear or surprise. He gestured for her to come forward. She did so, stopping just behind him. He grabbed her by the upper arm and pulled her forward until she was just in front of the line of humans. She felt terrified, uniquely vulnerable. Everyone was looking at her. She was, in that moment, more afraid of what the Nazrak were doing, so she faced them. She knew that the humans were capable of all kinds of evils, yet their known cruelty was preferable to the unknown dangers from what in other circumstances, she might have called her own kind. There was silence all around. Nadra wondered what she was brought here for. Surely they didn't think she spoke their language. She had been raised among humans since birth. Finally, Garrick behind her spoke up. We want some Nazrak power, he said. The Nazrak held still. We are willing to trade... But we will not leave without it, he continued. The Nazrak looked at Nadra. The leader spoke up. She spoke with a strange accent. Nadra suspected that few of them spoke in the human tongue. Are you offering this colorless one in exchange? Nadra wondered what she meant. 
Did the Nazrek have societal structures based on coloration? Was she considered of some low caste among them? We have gold. We are also willing to offer this Nazrak. How much and how much of our magic are you desiring? Fifty orbs. There's a bit of murmur among the Nazrak at that, which the leader quelled with a small gesture. And how much in gold? Twenty long bars, or eighteen, if you would like the Nazrak. Nidra tried not to show her surprise. Even a single long bar was more gold than she had ever seen in her life, though she had heard how much a long bar was. It was used for large purposes only. And she was trying to see... He was trying to see if her worth was two long bars. She knew that chattel slaves in the market could be bought in several dozens for a single long bar. Was he trying to take advantage of them? Or did he think she would be particularly valuable to them? And that's the end of the story this week. Obviously, more to come. I'm st still enjoying uh, writing about Nadris. She's... Uh, becoming one of my favorite characters actually and there's we're, we're at a sort of you know it's also always fun when you know there's like a turning point coming and obviously this is sort of a big deal for her uh if you've been following the story at all <laughs> so i hope you have been enjoying the story if you have any comments or questions about this episode or previous episodes cryptobiography at gmail.com or hit us up on facebook or twitter and thanks for listening Words of Music Copyright 2021, Cryptobiography LLC, all rights reserved. Characters and events are fictional, fictionalized, or satirical.